Does anyone remember how they define biblical theology for this class? It's been a few weeks. Someone, I mean, you hinted at it. It's the, it's the big picture, right? So it's, it's looking across time at how the Bible connects. Uh, unlike systematic theology, which is more systematic, and so it's looking less at history, less at the big picture of the Bible, but instead, what does the Bible teach about, and then whatever topic. So if we're looking at faith, we're going to go, what are all the verses that speak about faith? But in biblical theology, we're thinking about history, we're thinking about the storyline, capital S, storyline of Scripture. And uh, for me, it wasn't really, you know, I wasn't, I was saved as a freshman, and so the Bible is pretty new, um, freshman in college, and the Bible's new, and it really wasn't until I went to seminary that I started learning my Old Testament, and then even, then even more so how it all made sense, how it was actually not a bunch of just fragmented stories, but actually one overarching purpose of God. So I love this discipline. It makes the Bible come to life. And our generation now is spoiled because there's so many kids' resources that do this for us uh, really well. The, the big picture story Bible, the biggest story. I mean, there's all kinds. Our website has tons of them that helps us make the connections, which I think is super helpful, right? Because at the end of the day, how many authors are there of scripture? One at the end of the day, right? And so it's got unity. There's, there's continuity and discontinuity, but at the end of the day, it's one big story. So we've been looking some now um, at themes. So you can pick a lot of themes that really unite the story of scripture. And so last week, uh, I wasn't in here, but thinking about Eden, you know, or Jerusalem, or presence, God's presence, beginning in the garden, going all the way until the new heavens, new earth, or, uh, yeah, temple. In some ways, Eden is a temple, and then you have the tabernacle and the temple, and then the church is the temple, and then ultimately the whole world's a temple, or a uh, king. Adam is a king. He's to rule, and then there's your kings that are very faulty, and they point forward to a final king, who's Christ, or sacrifice. They're in the garden. Someone is sacrificed to cover the shame of Adam and Eve, and then you have the sacrificial system, and then you have Isaiah 53 and the suffering servant, then you have, behold, the Lamb of God, and then you have the Lamb on the throne. You know what I mean? There's just, there's, there's 15, 20 of these themes that really unite the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Sabbath is another one. God rested. There, Israel's commanded to rest. There's a rest yet to come. Jesus brings rest. Come to me, all who are weary. So anyway, I love that. I love, because I love the Bible, so I love seeing the connections. And today's theme is one of my favorites as well. It's the people of God. So let me pray, and we're going to jump in and hopefully leave a little time for Q&A. And as all faithful Sunday school classes do, end by 1015. <laughs> <laughs> let me pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your kindness, and thank you for your word. You haven't left us in the dark, and so we're so grateful and so glad that we don't have just a bunch of like Aesop's fables, but we have a grand story that unites all of world history, and we're thankful for that, and pray that you'd be with us this morning, help us to think hard and think clearly about another theme, really who we are, and so I pray that we would understand who we are, understand our identity more as a result of our uh, short time together. Thank you for including us in your people and in your plan. We pray it in Christ's name, amen. All right, before we jump in, book giveaways, got to do that. So I actually have written a little book uh, on this theme of God's chosen people. I will warn you, this is not easy reading. So I've got five copies. Let's see, Eric, if you just pass those back. George, they're not signed. Who else? Jackson. Who else? Karen. I have one more. You can find this on Amazon, by the way. Um, supports hungry children. <laughs> All right. <laughs> 12 bucks on Amazon supports a good cause, I hope. <laughs> That's right. All right, so um, let's think then about the people of God uh, and think about the way the Bible describes it. And one of the hard things is it describes us in so many different ways. What's a mixed metaphor? Kind of hard to define. It's easier to come up with examples than to actually define it, right? The New Testament is filled with metaphors for the people of God, images, but especially mixed metaphors. And so in his really good book, uh, Church Membership, that we give out in our new membership class, Jonathan Lehman says the New Testament authors, are they start talking about the church and its members, and they push this mixing of metaphors into hyperdrive, like hitting the turbo button on a racehorse. 
That's a mixed metaphor in case you didn't know. <laughs> Paul, though, is the one that really does it. He speaks of being baptized, immersed into a body. It's a mixed metaphor, right? Being dipped into a torso. It doesn't really work logically. Paul speaks of, or Peter speaks of the, the church, the people of God as living stones. Mixed metaphor. We'll look at that passage here in a little while. And then he says in that very same passage that we, the people of God, are living stones who are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood. So stones, who are we? Are we the stones or are we the house or are we the priesthood? Yes, all the above. Any other, any other metaphors for the church you can think of from Scripture? What's the main one when we speak about the church? Body, right? Yeah, I mentioned that. What else? Living sacrifice, bride of Christ, yeah. A flock of sheep, branches of a vine. We already mentioned a temple or a building, a people, exiles, a nation, holy nation, royal priesthood, salt of the earth, the elect lady, on and on and on. Images just keep coming, one piled on top of another. And so as we think about the story, biblical theology, so Genesis to Revelation, the story of the people of God, in many ways, this ties into what we've seen. I think especially the, the I think it was Scott Kemp's lesson on kingdom through covenant is th these two go, go really close together. And so let's just think together about the story of the people of God. So where do we start? I know half of you can't, I'll talk through this because I know you can't read it because both my writing and the size, but starts in Genesis 1. Well, think about the people of God in Genesis 1. What does God command? Very first command, be fruitful and multiply. Make babies, make culture, rule and subdue. And so here we are, the first people of God, the first couple are commanded to multiply themselves and to rule as God's image, as God's representative. And so if there had been no sin, they would have just continued to multiply and rule and subdue, you know, the Garden of Eden. I don't know how much Stephen got into this, but it wasn't the whole world, right? There was the garden, this sacred space, and then there was all the as yet uninhabitable spaces. And so if there would have been no sin, Adam and Eve would have just had babies and they would have ruled under God's, God's tutelage as well. And they would have continued to expand and expand and expand until ultimately, if there had been no interruption in Genesis 3, the glory of the Lord would have covered the earth as the waters cover the sea. Well, Genesis 3 really screwed that up, right? So you have the, the command, God wants us to multiply. He wants his people to extend his rule through multiplication. But, of course, Genesis 3. So go ahead and open your Bible. We have what we call the fall. The tragedy. And God curses the serpent. But I want us to notice something that in the midst of that curse, what he says. Y'all have probably seen this verse quite a bit because it's the first promise of the, of the gospel in the Bible. It's the first promise of the Messiah in the gospel, really, in Genesis 3.15. Someone want to read Genesis 3.15 pretty loudly? So right from the beginning, we have this curse slash promise of what we could say the rest, in some ways, the rest of the story of Scripture is this story of two seeds or two offsprings. Right there, you have the offspring of the woman and you have the offspring of the serpent. And there's going to be hostility between them. Seed of the woman, seed of the serpent. So right from the beginning, there will be hostility and that will never end. It's perpetual animosity between these two seeds. Starting right off the bat with who? This is the very first seed of the serpent that goes at war against the seed of the woman. Cain and Abel, right? <laughs> Doesn't take long. And then, you know, you keep looking down the storyline of Scripture, skipping through Genesis. You can look at the brothers in some ways against Joseph. You can look at Exodus. You can look at the, the Hebrew midwives. And then Pharaoh. You can look at Pharaoh against Moses, Israel, Egypt, Israel, the nations, church in the world. And so it's a really important theme that I think we downplay. I think part of that has been, speaking now, fast forwarding to the church, I think part of it has been, is it's been fairly easy to be a Christian in America for the last, you know, many, many years. And just now in the last really five, especially, are we seeing this more clearly? And I think it's actually good to have a wake up call. Oh yeah, 
this world is actually against us. Things aren't okay. Well, it started right back here in Genesis 3.15, that there would be these two seeds and there would be hostility between them, people of God, people of the enemy, people of the world, however you want to describe it. In Genesis 3.15, it's the seed of the serpent. So there we go. It's not going to be easy for the people of God. We learned from the very beginning it's going to be a war. It's going to be hard. Well, fast forwarding, you have the flood. God preserves, Genesis 6 to 9, God preserves his people. He didn't have to. He would have been totally just to end it all, but he didn't. He preserved Noah, who in many ways is like a new Adam, and he tells Noah to be fruitful and multiply. And then we have some of the grandest promises in Scripture in Genesis chapter 12. So I want to read those first three verses loudly, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. So now this people of God are going to be focused and actually come from this call of Abram. It's really important to remember who Abram was before he was called. Abram uh, was a total pagan. Joshua 24, 2 tells us he was a moon worshiper. And God really just of his own accord, of his own sovereign will, picks him and says, here, you're going to go with me. And he makes these promises and says, basically, you're going to be blessed. I'm going to bless you. You'll be the recipient of blessing, Abram, and your family. But I've got an end goal. I've got a larger agenda. And that's what he says there at the end. And through you and your family, all the families of the world will be blessed. Genesis 18 will say all the, the nations will be blessed through the offspring of Abraham. So notice right off the bat, the people of God have this so that purpose blessed so that they might be a blessing to the nations. So right off the beginning, that's really important to understand this outward focus of the people of God. So blessed in order to be a blessing in all the families of the earth. The promise is repeated multiple times. Flip over to Genesis 35 with me. It's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The promise is repeated using the same language. I'll make your offspring as the sand of the sea. I'll bless you and through you the world will be blessed. Look at uh, Genesis 35, verse 11. More of the same. God here says to Jacob, I'm God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. What an astounding promise. A nation is going to come from Jacob, but not just one nation. A company of nations will come from Jacob. Jacob will be the father of many nations. It's what Abraham was promised as well, right? Father Abraham. All right, so looking at the story, Genesis 3, Genesis 12, let's skip over to Exodus 19. So knowing the story, God frees his people. The Exodus is the greatest deliverance, really, in the whole Old Testament. And just like God promised to Abram, I'm going to make them a nation. That's what he does in Exodus 19. So he frees them, he delivers them, he redeems them, and notice what he promises or kind of what he commands here. Someone read Exodus 19, 4 to 6. So notice the, the clear promises, but notice this if. And that's what's a little bit different here about this covenant, the old covenant versus, say, the Abrahamic covenant or the Noahic covenant. In Exodus, there's a lot of if language. If you, if you, if you. And if you do, who will you be? Well, notice the way he describes his people. They'll be my treasured possession. Of course, God owns everything. The word here actually, though, is this word that kings would use for their special treasure. So the king would own a whole lot, but he had his his special treasure, his special garden, his especially prized possession. And that's what the word here is, treasured possession. For all the earth is mine, and they will be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. 
So again, what do priests do? Priests mediate between God and the nations. So God is saying the whole nation now will be priestly. They will mediate. That was to be their goal. That's why God, if you ever look at a map, that's why God placed them where he placed them, very strategically. It was so that the nations, the pagans, would come through and see their ways, Deuteronomy tells us, and ask about their God, and by their obedience, they would draw them in, and they would be a kingdom of priests. They would be a holy nation, just like God promised. They would be a nation, and so we have the giving of the law, the giving of the sacrificial system, priesthood, kingship, all that. They do become a nation. But that if part is really important because the history of Israel is the history of idolatry right from the beginning, right? What happens right off the bat? Golden calf. They make a false god and give him the glory right off the bat. So something's wrong. Something's wrong with Israel. Something needs to be changed. Something's not going well with Israel. Well, flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy is the, the second giving of the law and Again and again, we see the, the commandments and then the failures of the people of Israel, but God never leaves us to ourselves. Praise God, he doesn't, even though he could justly leave us to ourselves. And in Deuteronomy 30, after all these blessings and curses of the covenant, and there's a whole lot more material about the curses than there are about the blessings, let the reader understand, because he knows they're going to fail. And in Deuteronomy 30, that's basically what he says. Hey, you're not going to keep this covenant, and you're going to go into exile. And judgment, but again, God's last words never judgment. And so, what does He promise? Look at verse five, or look at verse six. Promise, future tense. And the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and that you may live. Well, there we see real early on. This is such an early promise, right? This is before exile that they're going to go in exile because of the disobedience, but something has to change. And here God promises he's going to be the one who changes. There's actually commandments in various, a few places in the Old Testament where God commands his people, circumcise your heart. They're not able to. We can't do that. He must. And here in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, it's a promise, which it's not up here, but you know, right here. It's a promise that in the future, God's going to circumcise the heart. What a weird image, isn't it? Circum I just wonder what the first hearers what does that even mean, Moses? Circumcise the heart. Well, the idea is there's this, there's this layer of fatty tissue around the heart. They've got hard hearts. They're stiff neck. They couldn't obey. They needed new hearts in order to be able to respond to God's commands. Batteries were not included in the old covenant. There was no power to obey. So skipping here, a lot of history and a lot of prophets, they begin to promise that God's going to do something new. God's going to change his people. So just think with me. We won't turn there for the sake of time, but just think about Ezekiel 36's imagery. I'm going to take out the heart of stone. I'm going to put in the heart of flesh in the new covenant. It's the same language that Deuteronomy 30 uses. I'm going to circumcise your heart. What we would say today in terms of systematic theology is God's going to regenerate us. So we needed heart change, and in the new covenants, the pouring out of the Spirit Pentecost, Acts 2, that's what we have, heart for the Lord. So now we can obey. So often Israel just couldn't obey. They didn't have the heart to respond. They were hard-hearted. Well, that's one of the differences the new covenant brings is inward change and final forgiveness. So the people of God, it was a struggle. Israel, again, the history of Israel is the history of idolatry, but the prophets begin to speak of this new work God's going to do. So let's look at Jeremiah 31, the most famous passage about the new covenant. Did y'all look at this, Scott? Did y'all look at Jeremiah 31? You did. Okay, then we can be quick. Jeremiah 31, 31. The, one of the most important promises in the Old Testament. While we're turning there, let me stop. Is this, is this clear so far? Just making our way about through the storyline. Any questions provoked so far? We may get there, but we're covering a lot of material in short order. Clear enough? All right, so I want to read Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34.
not according to the covenant that I made with your fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, so I will not make it to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law on their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the last of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more, says the Lord. Such a good promise. Notice. Notice the I will, I will, I will. That's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. One of the differences in the Old Covenant, if you, if you, if you, if you, here the promise is, I will, I will, I will. God's going to do this. And again, if we were to summarize what he says there, paraphrase what he says there, what does he say? Two main things, two main gifts. Number one, in this New Covenant community, in the people of God, all will know the Lord. Think about Israel, it was a mixed bag completely. They were all within the covenant community, meaning they were all within Israel. They all received the sign of circumcision, but there were a whole lot of them that actually didn't know the Lord. That's why we speak of a remnant. There was a remnant of Israelites within the people of God who knew the Lord, but most of them did not. So the promise in the new covenant is in the new covenant, in the new covenant community, in the church, all will know the Lord. All will have the law not externalized, telling them what to do, but giving them no batteries to do it. Instead, we will have it written on our hearts. It will be changed from the inside out. That's why Jesus cares so much about the heart. And not only that, just think about being uh, a part of the people of God under the old covenant. You had to go every year, every year to the temple, scrapping what you'd find, doing what you had, often your prized possession to sacrifice. Every year it was a reminder, sin's not been dealt with. Sin's not been dealt with. Sin's not been dealt with. And here the promise is, there in verse 34, in the future, in this new covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel, house of Judah, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Full and final forgiveness of sins. No more needs. I don't think we think about the old covenant sacrificial system enough and just how dreadful it was and how bloody it was and how just nasty it was. No more. One final sacrifice. Promises of the new covenant, full and final forgiven people and people who are changed from the inside out. We'll say more about Jeremiah 31 in a minute, but then you move on to the New Testament. A good way to think about this is all these promises so far that we've seen come down. This is short for Christ. So all these promises from the Old Testament are making their way in. Again, this is the importance of seeing all these themes like the king, who's the final king, true king, Jesus. Who's the final sacrifice, Jesus. Who's the true temple, Jesus. Destroy this body in three days, I'll raise it up. Who's the on and on and on, Sabbath, Jesus. It all comes down to him. 2 Corinthians one twenty. All the promises of God find their yes and amen in him. All the promises. So everything comes down to him. All the promises. And you think about so many of the promises of the Old Testament are promised to who? A little more specific. If, then. Obedient Israel. There's no promises just for Israel, period. It's for the obedient Israelite. How many obedient Israelites are there? Singular. <laughs> One. We'll see that. Paul says that explicitly in Galatians chapter 3. So everything is funneled down to him. John 1 puts it like this. Jesus came to his own, and his own did not. This is John 1, 11 to 13-ish. Jesus came to his own. His own did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, to them he gave the right to become Children of God, people of God who were born not of the will of man and not of the, not of the will of flesh, not of blood. So what we see happening is the old covenant was fo focused on ethnic Israel. And in the new covenant, the people of God, any ethnicity, 
because Jesus opens up to all who did receive him, anyone. So it all boils down to him, and then he opens it up to anyone who will receive him. John 1, 11 to 13. To them, he gave the right to become the people of God. Or if you think about uh, Mark 1, you don't have to turn there, but just think about these gospels. So John says it very clearly, it all funnels down to him, and he opens it up to anyone who trusts in him. Uh, Mark 1, the first verses, he's quoting Isaiah and Malachi. Those first chapters of all the Gospels are loaded with Old Testament. Why? Because the Gospels are shouting from a soapbox, the story of Jesus that I'm about to give you is the completion, culmination, and fulfillment of the story of the Old Testament. It's all coming here. And so just like the prophet said, so I've seen in Matthew again and again and again, this was to fulfill what the scripture said. That word fulfill is used 13 times. This was to fulfill. This was to fulfill. This was to fulfill. The story of Jesus is the completion, culmination, fulfillment of the story of Israel. It's all coming down to him. And Matthew wants to present Jesus then as that faithful Israelite. Just think about the history of Israel. You've got, they're created. They go through the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness. They go to the mount where Moses gives them the law. They're exiled. What's Matthew doing? Like macro structure of Matthew. Matthew chapter uh, 2, out of Egypt, I've called my son. Speaking of Jesus, Jesus has an exodus experience. Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, is tempted in the wilderness. And unlike Israel, he's faithful, he's He parts the waters of the Red Sea. He's baptized, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus goes up on the mounts to give the Sermon on the Mount. What he's doing is he's replaying the whole history of Israel in himself. And what gets him in trouble, right? What gets Jesus, let me just stop. What gets Jesus in most trouble there early on in his ministry? Changing the ways. Yeah, I'm looking for something a little more specific. That's true. How? Claiming authority. True. Looking for something else. Forgiving sins. True. What? Sabbath. Yeah, Sabbath's one. But still, there's, there's still a bigger issue that got him in most trouble. Do what? Claiming to be God. Yes. What? Teaching. Yes. What about this? Why, do his, why does his hometown almost try to throw him off a cliff? Prophet, yes, but what does the prophet say that gets him in trouble? Yes. Yep, true. All right, still not the answer I'm looking for. <laughs> yes. Yes. Remember Luke 4. Think with me. Luke 4. Luke 4. Or really what we've seen in Matthew. Those are all right answers. But there's one main issue that the religious leaders of the day can't stand about him. And Luke 4 is probably most clear where he goes to his hometown of Nazareth for the first time. And they like him at first because he busts out Isaiah. But then he tells a couple stories of a couple times, two times in the Old Testament that God showed grace to Gentiles, Gentiles. So all right answers, but one of the main reasons that the religious leaders crucified ultimately Jesus was because who did he forgive? What kinds of people did he go after? Who was he quick to welcome? Jew, yeah, everyone, Jews and Gentiles. Luke 4, they hear the story and they get angry and try to throw him off a cliff. Why? Because he told two stories from their Bible where the God of Israel happened to show grace to Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles, to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become the children of God. The, one of the main difference practically between the old covenant and the new covenant is the new covenant is international. Because Christ doesn't care about ethnicity. He cares about sinners in need of grace. Let's see how Paul, there's so much we could, man, time flies. We could say so much. Let's just look at one book. Let's look over at Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Let 
It's not to say there were never Gentiles that were shown grace. Gentiles could join Israel, but it sure wasn't easy for a whole host of reasons, namely in a culture where there was no anesthesia. I'll stop there. Adult males had to be circumcised. It wasn't a very attractive option for most men. So there was this whole category of God fears that were not quite there, but they were attracted to something. So largely, Abraham and his family were ethnically Jewish, where Christ, the true obedient Israelite, opens it up to whomever has faith in him. So Galatians, this is one of the main things in Galatians. Galatians, they started, Paul started a church, everything's going well. And then these other Christians came in. They did believe in Jesus, but they were saying, basically they were saying, yes, Jesus is good, but you also need to obey the law to be justified, to be right with God. But at the same time, another angle of that is, yes, faith in Jesus is good, but you also need to become Jewish. So one of the things Paul is, is jealous to do is show that in the new covenant, it doesn't matter. Ethnicity doesn't matter at all. So look at Galatians 3, 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Listen, you don't have to become Jewish. Your ethnicity doesn't matter. You don't have to obey the Mosaic law. You have to have faith. It's those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Then verse 9, so then those who are of faith, in other words, Christians, the church, they're blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And then look down at Galatians 3, 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring who is Christ. Christ is the singular seed of Abraham, the singular offspring of Abraham, but it doesn't stop there, right? He opens it up. That's what really Messiah means. It's like representative personality. So let's keep reading. Look at 23, 26. Galatians 3, 26. For in Christ Jesus, you are all Galatians, Gentiles, pagans, sons of God. Now that you have faith, you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. There it is right there. People of God in the New Testament, if you are of Christ, if you trust him, then you are heirs of the promise to Abraham. And so one of the themes is this theme of the people of God, and there's one people of God from Genesis to Revelation. The new covenant changes that people from the inside out and brings full and final forgiveness. But if you are of Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. One more passage, 1 Peter 2. Actually, hold on, hold on, we're not done. Go back to Galatians 6. Galatians 6. Now, this, there's a lot of, there has been 50 years ago a lot of debate about this passage, specifically with the debate about um, the relationship of Israel and the church. But 6.16, well, let's pick up at 6.15. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, upon the Israel of God. So he mentions this rule, this rule of the new creation. What is the rule according to the text? What is the rule of the new creation according to the text we just read? It's in, it's in the verses we just read. Use the language of the text. There you go. What's the rule? Circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision doesn't matter. In other words, ethnicity doesn't matter, which is what he said back in chapter 3, right? There is no Jew, there is no Greek. Let's read it again. 6.15. For 
Neither circumcision counts for anything, being Jewish, doesn't matter, nor uncircumcision, being Gentile, doesn't matter. What matters? A new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, that rule I just mentioned, peace and mercy be upon them, namely the Israel of God. This is one of those passages that we're at the very end of the letter. He really redefines the Israel of God. Now in the new covenant, who is the Israel of God? Anyone who holds to the rule of the new creation. What's the rule of the new creation? Circumcision doesn't matter. Uncircumcision doesn't matter. Sometimes people will say that verse at the end, he's talking about ethnic Israel. Peace and mercy be upon ethnic Israel. But that would undermine the entire letter that we've seen so far, where he's said again and again and again, it's those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. That being Jewish or Gentile doesn't matter. That circumcision or uncircumcision doesn't matter. And so what he's doing, it's sort of a, he's, he's kind of a jab with them to say at the end of, God, end of the letter, after I've said there's one, People of God, you're all one in Christ. Peace and mercy be upon this one people of God, who is the Israel of God, which in the new covenant includes anyone who has faith in Jesus, includes any ethnicity from anywhere. Let me, let me read one more, and then we'll stop and ask, ask some questions. First Peter 2. So Peter now in the, in the New Covenant is going to talk about us, the people of God, but I want you to notice the language he uses. It's language that we've already seen, especially from Exodus 19, back here in the ratification of the Old Covenant with Israel. How does Peter apply this label, these labels to the church? Look at 1 Peter 2, 9. But you, it's plural, y'all, Y'all are a chosen race. Isn't that interesting? We're a race. We're like the third race. This is what the early church fathers called the church. We're the third race. You're a chosen race that consists of all races. You're a royal priesthood. That's that language of kingdom of priests from Exodus 19. You, church, are a holy nation. Fascinating. We're a nation that, is, that knows no national boundaries. We're a people for his own possessions that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Then he quotes Old Testament. Once you were not a people, now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, now you have received mercy. Let me stop there. That's a lot. Any questions, comments so far on what we've seen? Two main changes as we move from Old Covenant to New. Number one, inward transformation. And number two, full and final forgiveness of sins. Yeah, sorry. Forgiveness. So there's a real sense in that we're, we're unlike Israel of old because we have new hearts. The Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out. The Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. It was promised and then it came in Acts 2, that says Pentecost, if you can't read it. Holy Spirit's poured out, and now there's this permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit that the church has that Israel did not have. And so our life trajectory ought to look better than Israel's, and praise God, it does. That's why there's like, think about Psalm 51 after David uh, commits adultery, and he prays, God, take not your spirit from me. He had seen that happen to Saul. Saul had been bestowed with the Spirit temporarily, but then removed because of disobedience. So David saw that. I don't want that to happen to me. A New Covenant Christian can't pray that because we can't lose the Holy Spirit. We've been sealed as we trust in Christ, permanently indwelt with the Holy Spirit. It's one of the gifts of the New Covenant. It's one of the ways that the church is different than Israel. Surely there's questions at this point. There's one. And so Jason...
Yeah, and that vision happens like three times there in Acts 10, 11, doesn't it? it I mean, just think, though. We, it's easy to kind of poke fun of them. I know you're not poking fun of them, Jason. Um, but think, it was all they knew, right? It's all they knew was that Gentiles are unclean, and it's actually dishonoring God to include a Gentile, especially at your table. And so, yeah, it took a little while. That's what Acts 15 is all about, the Jerusalem Council. Hey, what's going on? Gentiles are receiving the Spirit. So the book of Acts, there's a lot of this. There's a lot in the New Testament. Acts, a lot of Galatians, a lot of Ephesians, from this transition from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Which is really helpful for missions. This is one of the things that's unique about Christianity when you think about it, unlike other religions. Christianity can come and take over, be at home in any culture in the world, unlike most religions, because we don't have the baggage, and we can come in in anyone. We don't bring in, you know, cultural baggage when we bring in the gospel. We just bring in the gospel. We can take the shape of whatever culture we're in, because anyone who comes to Christ is welcome. We will come the offspring of Abraham. Other questions? Yeah, so it's the only time, actually, that the word New Covenant is used. Now, that doesn't really matter, right, because it's terminology, because we could call it, Deuteronomy mentions circumcision of the heart, same idea. Uh, Ezekiel mentions hearts, trans, heart surgery. Uh, Isaiah talks about the kingdom. There's lots of images, again, also for what God does. But Jeremiah, is uh, he explicitly calls it the New Covenant, but also Hebrews chapter 8 quotes Jeremiah 31. And Hebrews 8, it's actually the longest Old Testament quotation in the New Testament. and quotes the whole thing to say, this is now, this is fulfilled. This, this new covenant that promises all these things is now. And of course, don't we use that language every time we celebrate communion? It's what we're celebrating every time we celebrate communion. New covenant in my blood. Inward transformation, full and final forgiveness of sin. We can change and it is finished. Yeah, so uh, Ephesians 1, 4, 1, 12, 13, 14 uses that language. But a lot of the promises back here say Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 37, dry bones and the Spirit of God comes and brings dead people to life. Uh, Isaiah has a ton of promises. Isaiah 42, 1, 61, 1 and 2. Um, Isaiah 44, 3 to 5. There's tons of promises in the Old Testament about the coming of the Spirit. So the Spirit was alive and active. He has been for eternity, but he had not come and indwelt anyone yet in the Old Covenant. That was a future promise that was fulfilled in Pentecost. So tons of Old Testament uh, promise. Joel 2 is a big one that Acts 2 quotes. So Joel 2 speaks of the coming Spirit, and Acts 2, Pentecost quotes, hey, this is now. So there's, there's a, a qualitative difference in the activity of the Spirit so that he can't leave us, won't leave us. Yeah, so Romans 11 is a very complicated passage. Um, we preached through Romans here if you weren't here, and uh, that sermon might be more helpful than the 45 seconds I'm about to tell you. <laughs> but I would just say when we read Romans 11, one of the important things is to ask what time frame is Paul talking about? So Romans 11, 5, so too at the present time there's a remnant. Romans 11, look over at verse 30. Uh, now have received mercy, now been disobedient, now have received mercy. And the whole context of, of Romans 11 is Paul's present tense. I think a lot of people read that as off in the future somewhere, and that's a legitimate reading, but I don't, think that's, I don't think that's what he's talking about. I think what Paul's talking about is this whole process by which, and you'd have to go read it to see what I'm talking about, but the whole process by which Gentiles are coming to Israel's Messiah in faith, which will cause the Jews to be jealous, and then they will turn to Christ which will cause more Gentiles to become saved and more Jews to become saved. And in this way, Romans eleven twenty five, 25, through this process, every Israelite will be saved. 
So it's a historical process that started in Paul's day that will go, I think, until the very last um, Christian is saved, basically. But again, that's a, that's a very uh, dense chapter of Scripture. I think one reading, so there's lots of different readings from different theological systems, but I think the reading that wants to say that Israel and the church are separate is most problematic for all of the reasons that we've seen so far. To say it's a separate people and actually their ethnicity does matter when the whole New Testament says it doesn't matter, I think that's the most problematic view. But good godly people uh, hold that view. So, One more passage, and maybe I'll provoke some more questions. Um, since we're there, if you're in Romans, go to Romans 2. We'll double click on that question just a little bit. So as we think about the many metaphors of the church, the vast majority, I need to check, it may be that all of them have Old Testament roots. So the metaphors for the church, most or all have the, the root in the Old Testament. So let me just, we're going to look at Romans 2, but let me just throw out several here. The church is called the beloved of God, which comes from Deuteronomy and the Psalms and Isaiah. It's called the church, the assembly, the ecclesia, which is in Deuteronomy and 1 Samuel and 1 Chronicle. The sons of God, Exodus 4. The Abraham's seed in Galatians 3. Children of the Jerusalem above, Galatians 4. Fellow citizens, we see in Ephesians 2. We'll look at Romans 2. Uh, speaks of the temple. The bride comes from Isaiah 54 and Ezekiel 16. A vineyard from Isaiah 5, the vine. An olive tree, which Romans 11 mentions, Isaiah 17. Sheep comes from Jeremiah a special people we saw from Exodus 19, a royal priesthood, a holy nation from Exodus, a chosen race from the same. So you, you get the idea, but let's look at Romans 2 and see how Paul defines us. Keeping Deuteronomy 30 in mind, that promise of the circumcision of the heart back in Deuteronomy, notice what he says in Romans 2, 28. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly nor is circumcision outward and physical. Man, what a statement. Paul just said circumcision has nothing to do with externals. It's nothing to do with outward, nothing to do with physical. The Gentile who way back in, you know, 6th century B.C., who joined the people of God as a 45-year-old man and was physically circumcised, uh, I wish I'd have known that. Well, the new covenant hadn't come yet. 228, no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. Meaning the old covenant law, his praise is not from man, but from God. I mean, it really can't get more clear. In the new covenant age, if you've trusted in Christ, if you've had your heart circumcised, if you have the Spirit of God, you are a Jew. That's what the text says. Or in Philippians 3, Paul warns the, the Judaizers who, again, were trying to basically bring the old covenant on the new. And he says, watch out for them. They're dogs, meaning they're unclean animals, Philippians 3, 2. They're evil workers. They think they're about good works. Their works are actually evil. And they're those who mutilate the flesh because they were trying to get people to be Jewish. They were trying to get people to be circumcised. Paul says they mutilate the flesh, which was the term used in 1 Kings 19 to speak of the pagans who would cut themselves trying to get their God to respond to them with rain. Philippians 3, 2. Then the next verse, verse 3, says, For we, church, Philippi, Gentiles, former pagans, we are the circumcision who put no confidence in the flesh, worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. So here, anyone, Jew or Gentile, if they trust Christ, they're a Jew. Trust Christ, they're the offspring of Abraham. They trust Christ, they are the circumcision. Because of the work of Christ and the work of the Spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what Jesus got, got after so much, right? Because at the end of the day, wasn't that the problem with the Pharisees? Outwardly religious, but their hearts were far from God. Outwardly, they say they know me. Inwardly, their hearts are hard. So yeah, absolutely. 
Christianity is a religion of the heart. Yeah, great question. So being here, Steve, uh, there are times where a Christian does become circumcised or do some other things according to the law. And this is where Paul is a very principled pragmatist, meaning he's going to, especially as a missionary. And so we could say what it would be like today would be Lottie Moon, for example, going over to China. Is she going to wear her, you know, I don't know what Lottie Moon wore. No, she's going to put on Chinese garb and she's going to adopt many practices, not all, because there's a fine line. Anything to do with idolatry, Paul says, put up a high wall, but can I dress this way? Can I eat this way? Can I learn this language? So he adopts practices in order to further the mission. He says that the same thing in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, which is fascinating for Paul to say. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, though I'm not a Jew. To the Gentiles, I became like a Gentile. To those who were without the law, I became like one without the law. Although I'm not without the law of God, I'm under the law of Christ. I became, to the weak, I became weak. To the strong, I became strong. I do all things. I become all things, all people, that I might save some. So speaking specifically of those passages in the New Testament, there were times where Paul would be evangelizing Jewish people, which is what he mostly did. And so he would, if you're going to bring, come alongside me, you better be circumcised. Now, I don't know how they checked, if they checked at the door or what. <laughs> but this is the difference between Timothy and Titus, right? So Timothy, he had circumcised because Timothy was going to be along with him to do evangelism in the, in the synagogue. Titus was not. In fact, in Galatians 2, they were trying, these, these people trying to make him become Jewish, tried to get Titus to be circumcised, and Paul says, not a chance. You won't force him to be circumcised. Was Paul totally contradictory? He has Timothy circumcised and tells Titus, not a chance. No, he was a missionary. Titus was among the Gentiles. It wasn't, there was no door check there. Timothy wasn't. I mean, Timothy was. So it was a principle of pragmatism that it's not wrong if you're Jewish to keep the Jewish law in order to rub circles with fellow Jewish people that they might hear the gospel and be saved. Other questions? We've got 15 minutes. Got more to say if you don't. <laughs> Always more to say. Yeah, good question. Huge question, actually. Um, so it depends on what we mean by some of the terms, right? So God doesn't change. God's, God's holiness doesn't change. But what God expects of his people did change. That's why many of you, and probably every one of you actually, would be violating the old covenant right now just from what you're wearing. Because you're wearing clothing of mixed fiber. Or what you had for breakfast. Uh, or a whole host of other, other issues. So while God's standard holiness, righteousness never changes. What he expects of his people does. So we are now not under the old covenant law, so we can wear clothing of mixed fibers, for example. Um, we can, uh, the Sabbath is fulfilled in Christ. So Saturday, yesterday was the Sabbath, and you weren't put to death if you mowed your lawn on Saturday. So you know what I mean? Those types of things. Or even interestingly, if you were here for our passage last week, Jesus says, uh, Moses said in Deuteronomy 24, you can you can divorce for any reason, but it wasn't that way from the beginning. So Jesus' standard for divorce is higher than Moses's. So you see what I'm saying? So it is important to show that what the people of God are expected to obey does change 
from the old covenants to the new covenant. Christians are not under the old covenant law. So that's important. We're under the law of Christ, 1 Corinthians 9, Galatians 6, 2. And there's tons of continuity for sure, but there is differences. Uh, this is helpful in evangelism because usually unbelievers don't understand that. They don't understand the Bible, and they love to say, you know, oh, you, do, you, do, you ignore half the Bible. You eat shrimp, don't you? And they don't understand, well, we couldn't have here. Praise God, now we can here. We're not under the old covenant anymore. So it's a complicated question, but it, here's what's interesting. You know, how many, how many imperatives are there in the old covenant? Anyone know? Commands? 613. Anyone know how many are in the new? Imperatives, so like commands. Over, over 2,000. Commands, like don't lust, like obey your parents, those sorts of commands and imperatives. So someone who's like, well, we're, it's all grace in the new covenant, they don't know their Bible. <laughs> There's, there's 2,000 imperatives that the people of God must obey in the new covenant. We just now can obey because we have batteries. Yeah, and I would just say, I totally agree. It's one of the main problems with the American church today is a lack of the fear of God. I think that's probably the heart issue, so I totally agree. But that's simply addressed by reading and teaching the Bible, New Covenant included, right? So if we would get back to actually teaching the text of the New Testament, that would take care of itself. Yeah, read the Bible every day. Uh, find a church that teaches the Bible. Those are first basic steps. If those two, you're not reading the Bible or not in a church that teaches the Bible, that's a real quick first, second step. Absolutely. Let's talk just a little bit about um, local church implications. So everywhere, um, everywhere in the New Testament, the assumption is if you're part of this people of God, you will be in a local church. The vast majority of the uses of the word church are local churches, the church at Rome, the church at Corinth, the church Galatia. And so in Abilene, but probably everywhere, there's this category of, well, I'm a part of the universal church, but I don't go anywhere. I really have big questions about someone's salvation that doesn't that regularly attend a local church. So everywhere in the New Testament, the, the assumption is that if you're part of the universal, you're going to be part of the local. So how does this get down to us? Well, it means linking arms with local, local believers. Uh, this, is why, this is why we emphasize membership so much at Southside, is we truly believe you will grow best with being all in at a local church where the family of God actually becomes the family of God. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm, I'm a member of the universal gym. Never go to a local gym. It just It's not going to benefit me. I pay monthly, never been. It's not going to benefit me. So it's got to make, it's got to have a tangible expression locally, which is why we care so much. And listen, in the new covenant, remember Jeremiah 31, all will know the Lord. 
There will be none, none in the church where some say, know him, you need to know him. We do that outside the church, but in the church, it is a, to use Baptist language, a regenerate church. This is why we do our best at Southside to make sure only believers join the church. Now, could we get that wrong at times? Absolutely. But when, that's why we have a long membership class, and this is why we want to pound home the gospel, and this is why we interview people coming in. Hey, tell me about your testimony. Can you tell me the gospel in 60 seconds or less? Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump, and we don't want to let an unbeliever in the church membership. We want unbelievers all over this place, not in the church membership. This also applies to church discipline. If you've been here in Matthew 18, 15 to 20, why do we do church discipline? Because unbelievers don't need to be a part of the church. And if someone is in persistent, unwilling, unrepentant sin, eventually, Jesus says, remove them from the fellowship. Why do we do that? All because of this stuff. Because in the new covenant community, all know the Lord, unlike the old covenant community. This is what makes us Baptists. So I've got tons of, let's just say, Presbyterian friends. They would say, well, no, no, there's unbelievers in the church. And specifically, what it means is they're babies, usually us and our babies. So our babies receive the sign, baptism, just like they would say, just like Abraham was to circumcise his babies. Well, see, now we're the same and we baptize our babies. By the way, there's no New Testament textual connection between the two. Um, and so they would say, so it doesn't really matter. We don't, you know, we may have membership, but we're not worried about having a regenerate church membership. And we just think they get the story wrong. We, we just think they don't see that the New Covenant community is consisted of regenerate people only. It's exactly what Jeremiah 31 says. All will know the Lord in the New Covenant community. And so this is why we apply the sign of the covenant only to believers, not to believers and their unbelieving children. You know we love children here. And we know we want you discipling the heck out of your children. Just don't bring water into the picture. That comes later. And this, this whole issue, this whole structure... Uh, is, is why they do that. We see that the nature and structure of the old covenant people of God is changed through Christ in the Spirit. Here, it was anyone born of Abraham. They received circumcision. Anyone. Didn't matter. Their heart didn't matter. Through Christ now, it's only those of faith who join the local church. There you go. We'll move them in. Yeah, it's really hard and it's really sad. I mean, to be honest, it's really sad. Uh, I know many of you know uh, how special this church is and sadly unique this church is. People, especially college students, in some ways we ruin college students here because they go off and they just can't, it's hard to find good, well-rounded churches. I think the easiest answer is to, to point them to our networks. And so we're within the Southern Baptist Convention, but we're part of a smaller group of Southern Baptists called Pillar Churches. Now, there's just not enough of them, though. But that'd be the first look at the Pillar website and see if there's a Pillar Church in that area. A broader uh, network would be the Nine Marks Church Directory. They would value things like elder leadership, expositional preaching, regenerate church membership, biblical theology, those sorts of things. Pillar and Nine Marks, their, their church directors are probably the first place to start. Yeah, well, it's super hard. Um, I would say, in all seriousness, 
move. And this is what, and listen, listen. The other thing is, when you're going to when you're going to move places, I wish we would do this more and more, college students or otherwise. When we're going to move, the first thing we need to be looking at is: is there a healthy church in that area? Not, not going. We really ought to structure our lives around a solid local church. Having said that, the, the kind of non-negotiables non, non, uh, for us as leadership at Southside, expositional preaching, preaching through books of the Bible, because if you're doing that, so much else will take care of itself eventually, because the Word does its work. So true expositional preaching through books of the Bible. Uh, elder leadership, because God wrote three books, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, about how the church ought to be structured, how he wants this church ordered, and he's explicitly clear it's a plurality of spiritually qualified men. So elder leadership. And then this one is harder, but I think it's vital, and that's regenerate church membership. Do they actually practice church discipline? And that alone, man, I'd hate to even think of how many in the United States there are that do those three. So if there's, a, there's a famine in the land. Uh, one, one final word, and I'll pray, and we'll, uh, I'm going to run over and skip out of here and get ready for Sunday. But um, keeping in mind back here, uh, back in Genesis 3, so here we are, distinct in the church. We're in this already, but not yet. So Pentecost has come, the cross has come, that says already, not yet. Um, but, but Christ hasn't returned yet. And so here we're in this time between the times where we've been forgiven, we have the Spirit, the victory's been won and promised, but we're still in a war. You think about, um, think about a wounded animal. They're at their most dangerous, right? A wounded animal is at its most dangerous, and that's the way the enemy is. That's, he's a wounded dragon, more vicious than ever. And so there's this explicit line, right? Genesis 3.15, seed of the serpent, seed of the woman. It goes through the entire, test, entire Old Testament, New Testament. Now it's church and world, and there is to be no... No mixing of the two. And that's one of the problems, Dylan, with the church today is we've tried to win over the world or be cool to the world or cut off our sharp edges that we might be popular. And as Max Style says, in order to reach the world, we've fallen in. There's this antithesis, seed of the woman, seed of the serpent. And so more than ever, we've got to gird our loins and realize to be a faithful Christian increasingly means war. It just does. And I don't know about you, but I'm really glad to be in it with you all. Work to do. Let's pray.